I'm Dave Morgenstern, and uh, this is my some of my goodies that I, I show, and I also run some of it at other shows. I really can't run a gas engine in the mall. They don't like it. So coming over here, uh, I have a bit of a history from the orchard. My dad was an orchardist, and he worked in the packing house. and. Uh, he worked in the processing plant and he also made boxes in his spare time. And this was dad's box maker's hammer. I know it looks like a shingled hammer, but it's a box maker hammer. And if you can, I don't know if you can see it, that's, that's a circle K, which was the, uh, the apple boxes were a uh, circle K, the Okanagan. And uh, so a box maker, had a stand and he had the box nails uh, underneath on the stand and he would put two end pieces in and he would put a side on it and he would take a bunch of, a bunch of nails in his fingers and he would go down the side of the box and he would just tick the nails and he would put six nails down and six nails down and then he would go back and he would hammer them home and he would flip the box over and he would do the same thing and then he would give it a quarter of a turn and he would put the bottom on it and uh, all with the box maker's hammer. Now when he was doing this they did not have workers compensation but they did have inspectors that came and the inspector they were a safety inspector and the safety inspector really didn't like to see the box makers and all their black fingernails. That was a no-no. So they came up, they came up with, go back a little bit, they dumped the whole, whole keg of nails in the box makers and they would slide down a rack as the guy hammered. So they came up with a box maker and they would, Dump, they filled this full of, of nails and the nails would shake around and they would hang out here and they would feed themselves down until they were single right here. And he would take his, his hammer and he would hit this and it would go down like so. And it would do the same thing, it would start the nail. And then he would pick up his hammer and he would drive them home. The box maker did not like these because they got paid by the box. And you can see the difference between grabbing a finger full of nails and picking this up, pounding it down, fill it up again, have a place to set it down. It, it cut their time. So they didn't like this. And I think if you were to go and find out where the processing plant for Penticton Co-op and dredge the lake, you would find a bunch of these in the bottom of the lake because the, the box makers, for some reason, kept losing them and they could go back to their fingers. So, so that was building uh, apple boxes and uh, Dad did that as well as running the processing plant, the, the pitting line for maraschino cherries. They made maraschino cherries uh, so that was his plus having an orchard. So uh, that's what I have for, for the box making and the processing plant. I, I'm a mechanic by trade and I used to do Babbitt bearings and this is, this is a Babbitt bearing. So, so the shaft of a machine ran and this was the top and this sat on it, and this is a soft, a soft metal, and as long as you kept it full of oil, which your oiler was here, this worked quite well, and, it, and a, the shaft kept running. And this was where you dumped the oil in, and then you, you closed it. When the Babbitt bearings ran out of oil, they would melt. And I used to do that on planer heads, and uh, you would, build dams on it and you would pour new new Babbitt on it. This is some Babbitt I 
melted out of one of these. This is new, this is new Babbitt. And when you poured it, then you had to fit your poured Babbitt to the shaft. Usually you had a dummy shaft and it was a little smaller. And then these were a variety of scrapers and you got in and these are sharp on the edge and they would cut the babbit and you would just keep keep scraping it and then you would put your sh good shaft in there and it had bluing on it and you could see the high spots and and so these were the babbit the babbit tools a whole variety of them there and there's your babbit this was a ladle and these were ladles you would pour your your babbit so you just learned how to uh, how to babbit a bearing This tester was for coils and condensers. Slim Bella had what, they, what he called Slim Spark Shock, and he, he rebuilt, supposedly rebuilt, Magneto's. Magneto is a different ignition system for gasoline engine. And when a person came in and said, I'm in a hurry, my tractor magneto died, I need it fixed, and Slim would say, well, I would have to send it to the coast. I don't have the test equipment, but it would be, if you're in a hurry, he said, I'll sell you a new magneto. So he would sell him a new magneto, and pretty soon he had a whole warehouse of non-usable magnetos. And he got feeling guilty, I guess, so one day he bought this meter, and it did all the testing, and then he had a whole warehouse full of good used magnetos that he could sell again. And this was, this was his original meter. It, it was a Penticton and Slim Spark Shop was down on uh, Front Street. Everybody that had kids and they, you read their comic books and uh, the Road Runner, he was on TV too and he had his, his brown box and he went like that and the dynamite blew up. That was a dynamite detonator. Pretty soon we got this one and this is a dynamite detonator too. And you put the key in the bottom and the wires to the dynamite caps, the wires were hooked on here and when all was clear you just gave it a spin like that and it put 12 volts out and a little amperage and it would, it would uh, set off the dynamite caps. Did anybody ever tell you, you can't get something for nothing? And the answer always is, well, of course, you can't. This is a water pump. It sits on a platform over a running creek, and the inlet, the water into it, comes in here, and the other end of the inlet is a minimum of 10 feet higher than this pump. And the water, you turn the water on and it runs through here and it runs out here. Your outlet for the pump is left or right. So this goes up to a cistern and you turn the water on and it runs through here and it runs out here. And when it comes up with a good velocity, this valve closes just like that. And the water is forced out here and it goes up into just a little bit of it goes up the pipe and it has a check valve so it doesn't flow back. And this pump will pump one tenth of the water that runs through here, it will pump it up the hill, one tenth of it, 10 feet, 10 times higher than your inlet. So it would pump, 10 foot drop would pump the water 100 feet, one tenth of the water. And it just left in the creek. There's people have found these in the in the woods, not so much anymore. And you would buy a creek and you would hear a tick, 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 and that would be this. And they had no idea where the water was going. It had it had quit being useful, but they left it in and it pumped water. So that's a water pump and it runs for free other than no gas, no electricity. No no and no, no hand pump. So that, that's a water pump. This, 
this is a water pump. And this is what they call the deep well jet pump. And it always marveled. <coughs> you pump the water down the, down the well. And I thought, well, you want the water out of the well. But you pump the water down here, and there was a jet in here. And the water came up. But the way this squirted up, it would take with it. It would draw water out of the well. And so you can see the size of the water going down, and you see the size of it coming up. So this was a deep well jet pump. So it was another way. That one you had to have water to start with. And uh, that was a pump. We can have a look at a collection of, of irons. This, this is your old, just standard iron. Remember mom having one like that, plugged into the wall, plugged in here, and, and she ironed. Uh, a lot of people, when they look at this one, they say it's a steam iron. That's where the water is. But that's not so. This took high test gas, and um, you lit it on fire. It had a little fire, just like a Coleman stove, a Coleman lamp. So this was a gas-run iron, and I still haven't figured out because it always looks to me like the fire was in here and the exhaust came out here. Now I don't know what you did with your knuckles, but anyways, that was. This iron, you filled it with charcoal and <coughs> lit it alight. You lit it up, just like barbecue charcoal. And it would get hot and you would iron with it. And I always wondered on, on husband's white shirt, how many little black spots there was from the, the sparks out of the iron. And, uh, this one is another char charcoal iron, just a little different. It's got the exhaust pipe out the side. And this one, I am sure, came out of a, out of a laundry because uh, this iron was heated by steam. This pipe going in here was a steam pipe. So that, that would have been a commercial iron in a, in a steam laundry. Miner's helmet. And this is a battery pack, and it was used by Jack Lawrence, I think, in uh, Copper Mountain. So this was your, your miner. He had his own light. He had his hard hat, and the uh, light shone out. That's how he mined, and this was a, a battery pack. Everybody has oxyacetylene torches now and all the rest of it. This was a high-test gas blowtorch. This was Dad's, and uh, it had a blue flame came out like this, and it was used for heating. It was heating tar for patching pipes in the orchard, and anything that needed some good heat. And uh, that again goes back into uh, oh, into the 30s, 40s. He still used it at the 50s. That's Dad's. I still use it in my shop for, for odds and ends when I need heat. Uh, one of the reasons an oxyacetylene torch is too hot and too spotted, this gave you good flame and you could heat things. This one was a miner's, a miner's lamp before they had the electric one. And it hung on the hard hat and it had carbide in it. And, and carbide and water made acetylene. So it would blow out acetylene here and you would light it up and it had a reflector and this was the miner's light as he worked. And, and it wasn't near as bright as this one or convenient. Now I had a school teacher that claimed he worked in the, in the mine and he used one of these all the time and that's what made him bald. Now, figure it out for yourself. <laughs> uh, this, 
This was another miner's light. He didn't hook it on his, he could run it like this or he could hang it on, on the post. Hmm. But he, it didn't hook on his hat. That was another one. And it was also, some of these were used for a bicycle light, which takes us to, okay, this was, this was another miner's light or bicycle light. And you can see people that listen to what I'm saying. If you remember the old bicycles, right at the top of the front fork, there was a little hook that went out and up. And this hooked on there. It slid right in here. It was shock absorbed and it was carbide. And here was your bicycle light. And it shone back and it shone out of the two red lights for side lights so that nobody ran over you from the side. And this was so you could see where you were going. This is another one that a bicycle light, this is how it, it hooked on the bicycle, same way, and it was it was spring-loaded, so you didn't damage it. And the fire was inside of here, so, so you had your light, your carbide. And the only thing I can't figure out, I always wondered if it was, if it was uh, also marine, because the, the two side lights were red and green, which in marine is port and starboard. So I always wondered, and I, nobody's ever asked me, answered this, this is Lucas. So this came from England. Lucas lights and all the Lucas products came from England. Hmm. So there's your, your bicycle light. And uh, one day I'm gonna find some carbide and I'm gonna light some of these up just for the heck of it. And uh, not really, not really popular when you do that. I did it once on an old miner's light in Mum's kitchen, and it came out of a sooty flame about this long. And Dad had just finished painting the ceiling, and I was not a very popular boy that morning. <laughs> I, me and my miner's light ended up out in the yard. My buddy Herb Allen and myself were invited down uh, where Palmer Sather ran his cattle and there was an old cabin there and it was this deep in, in junk and pine needles and everything else. And it, we were told you can have anything you find in there. And I found these, the pulley clothesline that hung outside and they were always aluminum. Well, we found these are the same thing, but they're a wooden, a wooden pulley. Really rare. They, this goes way back. And I was lucky enough to get them in six, about six months later, the cabin burnt. So these are a treasure out of it. When you washed wool socks, uh, they would shrink. So this was a sock stretcher. You pulled wool socks on this and you hung them out to dry and they kept they kept their size, they didn't shrink. Um, this one and the mate to this one, I'm quite sure that my wool socks when I was a little kid, that was a lot of years ago, uh, these were mums and my socks and dad's socks and brother's socks all hung on a set of these. And the neighbor, the neighbors, I always thought it was really too bad because they had wooden ones same thing but they were made of wood and I thought oh they're they must be a, they must be poor. Carrying on with the with the wash the uh, real soiled clothes they put them in, in a laundry tub the square beady washing tub and and they put the the dirty clothes dad's work pants and whatnot in it with lots of suds and you would, you would just pump it, keep it under water, and you keep pumping it. 
And what happened, when you drove it down, the water went up through these holes. There's many holes. There's a few holes here, and the water would come out of here very high pressure. So as long as you kept doing this, you had this high pressure, soapy water, firing its way through the, the clothing. So that was for the, not, definitely not the deli cuts. For the guys in here, uh, our Penticton group is called the Old Boys with Old Toys. And we have them as toys and we love to show them. But it's real important to uh, have it so the, the older people are, grew up in a city and doesn't know what the, the country is like. And the young kids know, know that the bicycle light, you don't put a battery in it and it lasts for three months. We're, we're, talking, we're talking lights that you had to light and you had a flame in it. Um, the blowtorch, that was prior to the common, all the propane equipment you have now. Uh, the irons, same thing. Uh, now Mama has a nice lightweight iron that's plugged into the wall and, and it got a thing that you push the button and it, and it steams the clothes so they get a nice crease in them. So this is, this is history and it's disappearing because there was a long era where it was just put on the shelf because I got a better model and pretty soon, well, it, then it went to the basement, then it went to the garage, and then it went to the garbage. Yeah. And I, I've always felt, I love the history and it has to be preserved, really does. And, and that's why we, we say we just have fun with it, but it's keeping it so that people can see it. And number two, we're educating our young people and we have young people that come by and they'll stay all day and they are just, just fascinated with it. Uh, I haven't got it in here. I have a ringer washer and I have a young guy, as soon as he sees it, he comes and he runs the ringer washer. Tough luck if he puts his fingers in it, he knows better. But they, and they just love to do this. And their parents, when they finally got ringer, rid of the ringer washer it was a blessing. Their kids now think it's a blessing. We got one that we can use. So that's where we feel that we're preserving history, collecting this and showing it. It's pointless to collect it. Nobody sees it. So we have shows and they know what it was like before and uh, they eventually get so that they want to collect it too. And, and our stuff can be handed down and not thrown away.